Hey everybody, what is up? How's it going? Hope you're having a fantastic day today, fantastic week. Uh, it's March. It's March. Um, last month of Q1. What is going on? What is working for you? Um, and everybody, listen, if you just found this show, I'll tell you real quick, what we do on the show is we talk with people who are killing it in business, killing it in life, and we deconstruct what they're doing. And we do all that so hopefully you can get that edge. You can learn something from people who have walked the path before and, uh, and give you a little bit of motivation in your day, a little bit of strategy and tactics that you can implement right now. Okay, today's episode, here's what we go over. Uh, we spend we spend quite a bit of time, and as you guys know, all these interviews are completely organic. Um, I don't have any agenda before we hop on the call, and I don't know what we're going to talk about. We just so happened to stumble on um, the notion of surrounding yourself with great people. Um, great people, that is your colleagues, great people on your team, uh, great mentors, uh, and we really kind of unpack, you know, what is it that top 20% of what you can do in your day, in your life, in your business that accounts for 80% of your results. Uh, we talk about how uh, how having those great people around you keeps you motivated, uh, how having great mentors keep you, keeps you laser focused, and we talk about, like, look, what, what, what's working for him today? Uh, and for him, you know, one of the things he talked about was staying on top of your database and how, you know, in your business – you know, we all have multiple spokes in our business, um, but at the end of the day, your database is your most valuable spoke. So how do you stay on top of it? Uh, how do you stay in front of it? And I'll tell you, one of the best ways is just dishing out great content. Well, how do you do that? There's lots of ways. You can write an article if you're a good writer, or you can do a podcast just like this. Yep. Um, and we can help you with that. Uh, today's sponsor is ViralCast, ViralCast with a K. Go check it out. Completely done for you podcasting service. Um, if you want to get access to people that you would not normally have access to, have a show. If you want to develop deeper connections with your database, get more credibility, do a show. Uh, if you want to get exposure to brand new people that you would never normally have exposure to, Start your podcast, completely done for you service. Go to viralcast.com, uh, and right now they're doing a completely early bird deal. Um, normally it's two grand as a setup fee. Yeah, I know it's expensive. It's 500 bucks after that, totally worth it. Um, but, uh, you know, a website gets built. Um, we submit a show to iTunes, to Stitcher. We help you develop the strategy for the show. We even send you a microphone. Um, right now, there's an early bird special. That setup fee is not two thousand bucks; it's a thousand bucks. So, if you want to save a grand and pop it out, fire it up, turn up the heat on your business, go go start it up. Go to Viocast. All right, um, let's get to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. yeah. Really quickly, before we get to the content, uh, you're not going to want to miss future episodes like this one. So what do you do? You know what? Get on my database. Uh, go to superagentslive.com. Um, download my free book. Uh, join the free membership site. We have some pre-listing package stuff there. We have some tracking stuff. It's all free. Um, so go do that while you're there. You know what? Why not subscribe to the show? And if you're so inclined... If you've listened to the show, you know what really helps us? We're always hovering about 100 on iTunes. And look, that's an achievement. There are hundreds of thousands of shows out there. And in the ultra competitive category of business, we're always about 100. Your reviews help us get this out to more people and to get better rankings. So I'd love for you to go to iTunes, submit a review. That would help the show. And hey, you know what? Every now and again, we do a shout out for those people. All right, let's get to the content. 
Today on the show, I'm excited to talk to today's guest. Now, look, here's the deal. You know, not all of you out there have teams. And sometimes, you know, I talk with you guys. I get emails all the time. You know, I don't have a team. You know, how many deals can I really do? Now, today's guest, he's got, it's him, two agents, and he's got three assistants. Now, here's the deal. Just that small skeleton crew, last year he did 200 deals. The year before that, 465. Um, we're going to talk about why he's moving kind of in the wrong direction. But, but one of the things, I mean, he doesn't know this yet, but one of the things we're going to dig in on is systems and processes. There's no way that a small team like that could do 200, 300, 400 deals without having absolutely bulletproof systems. I'm thrilled to welcome today's guest, Bruce McAlpin. Hey, Bruce, thanks for taking the time out. My pleasure. Now, listen, I've given the audience... You know, a nuts and bolts, bolts overview of what your business looks like, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you about what's working, what's not working, uh, and those systems that I alluded to. Uh, but before we get there, I'm always curious about you. So, so give us a, 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 some insight into who Bruce is. Uh, 50-year-old white middle age, <laughs> <laughs> middle, middle, middle America, Minnesotan, um, college-educated, uh, retired uh, officer in the army, um, you know, five kids Ooh. and work hard. You know, that's, that's really what we are. That's what I am. Uh, I get a great team. Uh, what I call a team. I know it's not quite, you know, a hundred agents working for me, but, uh, everyone is very efficient. They're very fluent. They're smart as whips. They should all be doctors. And, um, I'm very proud of them. So, so okay, you, you have a pretty, very, you know, college, military, all that stuff, um, and, and you have more kids than you do team members. Uh, you're a busy guy. Um, w- w- college, really quickly, what did you study there? Um, business and history. Business, um, is, was, so was that a dual uh, undergrad major? Uh, well, I had went and finished my, all of my uh, pre-studies in business, and then they decided I didn't know if I wanted to be in business. So then I transferred to a history major. Hmm. And that's why I say college educated, because I have 269 college credits and no degree. Okay, got it, got it. And, <laughs> and why, why, how come you quit at the last minute? Uh, I had to uh, fulfill my uh, military commitment. Okay, okay. So I went to ROTC, and that's a four-year, four-year commitment, and then you had to do your four years of being in the military, so... When I made the switch, I needed the fifth year, of which I never finished the fifth year. Got it. Okay. And by the way, if you like history, well, this is really off the topic, but um, if you, I know that you don't listen to this show, which hopefully after this interview, you'll realize that you should. Um, uh, but if, if you listen to podcasts, um, Dan Carlin's hardcore history is unbelievable, man. This it's okay. You, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll send it you. Uh, I'll send it an email, but you should really start listening to that. It's a, it's really a wonderful, wonderful podcast. Um, okay. So, so you, you again, college educated, you, you didn't finish, you went back into the military, you did your, now, did you do your four years and then get out of the military? Uh, I, I ended up doing the three because after the first Gulf four, uh, we were asked as officers if we wanted to retire early and I did. Then did you get Which into- I actually almost regret today, but you know, at the time it sounded like a good idea. Yeah. Now, did you did you get into uh, real estate right after that? You know, I, I came home and opened a construction company, um, and I sold that in 1997, and I've been in real estate since. Wow. Okay. So, and and give us a, a, some quick ins. I read your bio, but just really 30 seconds. Give us some uh, some overview about that, and then we're going to jump into real estate stuff. Well, when I when I started my my construction company, I mean, I think I built three houses the first year and mainly remodeled, did small stuff. Um, by um, six years later, I, when I sold my, uh, my construction company, I was doing, um, I had 70 houses either completed or under construction in the last fiscal 12-month period. So I, I, I sold it to a, a group, um, and they came in and took over the developments I was in. And, you know, they actually inherited the debt that we had for model specs, things like that. And, and um, you, know, you know, one of the things about being a builder that I always notice at closing is not everyone was really happy with the builder. Ironically, he tended to get the smallest checks. The biggest checks went to the realtor and the mortgage officer. So when I decided to sell my construction company, I thought, well, why am I fighting this? Let's get into real estate and mortgaging. So that's what I did. 
And the other thing, the other thing about that, Bruce, is that you know it's it's very you know you the the person or the group that bought your company inherited the debt, right? So there, it, being a builder, there is risk, right? You have you have market risk, environmental risk, all sorts of things. The interesting thing about real estate is no risk, L- literally zero risk, and and nothing but upside. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I always worked with land. I mean, you know, I was an engineer in the military, so one of the things that I I still continued to do at the time was buy land, develop it, and sell lots, which really helped me, I think, uh, uh, as far as blossoming as a realtor, because I controlled the land, which, you know, a lot of people ask me how to get into new construction sales, and that's what I always tell them, control the land. I mean, if you can control the lots, if you control control the takedown schedule or whatever the buyers or the builders need, you can control a lot of what's going on in your real estate career. Um, and that's just part of it. I mean, you know, I do a lot of foreclosure. But one of the things I think when you still want to stay consistently busy is you have to have a handle on what's going on in your new construction market. Got it. Okay. Now, okay. So look, you're, you're a successful guy. You're a successful guy as a builder, a successful guy as a real estate agent. Um, this is going to be kind of a wacky question, but, but you know, we've all, you know, the 80-20 rule, right? 20% of our effort typically will yield 80% of the results. In both those endeavors, both real estate as well as in your building background, what do you think is that has been that 20%, that magical 20% that is, contributes 80% to the bottom line? You know, surrounding yourself with people that have a great work ethic, surrounding yourself with people that are smart, honest, have great integrity, that they support you, um, they're Soul motivations daily isn't just what's in it for me. It's what's in it for my team, what's in it for us. Um, those are the things I think that make the difference between someone that's struggling to be successful uh, in our industry or someone that looks like everything magically appears in front of them. Uh, the people around them make, uh, you know, and obviously we pick the people around us, but the people around you are the most important part on a daily basis of what makes you happy, what makes you successful, what makes you want to get up and do this job every day. And, and, and you know, I, I, I guess I don't want to just, you know, shove it off on, on someone else, but without that motivation, this job would get tiresome. So when you say surround yourself with, with you know, uh, uh, hardworking people, you know, ethical, integrity, all that, you know, those are all, those are all great, great uh, words and terms. Um, are you talking about um, on your team or are you talking about, you know, uh, f- as friends and colleagues and peers, right? You know? Well, specifically, I think I'm, I'm talking about the people that work with me and on my team. Okay. Uh, but I think it, you know, I think in life generally I'm talking about everything. But, you know, that's not always as easy to do in life, but certainly on your team, you control that. So that would be something that, you know, I think it's important. Um, and I, I know I know a lot of successful real estate agents, and I think almost every one of them would, would agree, you know, where, what makes me, you know, a step above or a step ahead or, you know, what makes me think that, you know, I'm, I'm more successful at closing or, you know, getting transactions done. Those are the things that I think uh, a team does for you. Okay. Um, I would agree with all that. And I think people will listen to you and go, hey, Bruce, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. You know, I've heard that before. And, and you know, I, it, how do you go about – you know, how does one, uh, you know, let's say that somebody's out there, they're doing 20, 30 deals a year, they want to level up and they, and they, you know, they go, they, they want to follow your model, right? I want to get these great, hardworking, smart, integrity people on my, t- how do they go about finding them? Um, hopefully they help, they help you by finding you, but a big part of it, I think with finding them is when you're working with someone that you might see that they're going to be a rock star, you know, and you think that what they need is what you might have to offer uh, them, you know, what you might want to say, like, you know, I see that person doing 20 to 30 transactions a year, and I like what I see from them. I want them to be part of my team. I want them to help, you know, me because I think I can help them. And if there's some type of mutual need and trust, 
that's the type of person that you might want to be around uh, or want, you know, them to be around you. So, you know, maybe that's probably the, the first point. The second point is how do they speak? You know, what's their email look like? Um, what kind of car do they drive? Uh, and I don't mean like, is it a good car or a bad car? Cause I don't even know what one is anymore. I drive an old five. So I think, you know, it's that, that type of, you know, mentality the you know, do they, do they have aspirations beyond 20 to 30 sales? Um, you know, and why are they only at 20 or 30 sales? Not just what can they do to get better? Why are they limited? So asking those questions and delving into those, you know, observations, I think that helps you qualify people. Okay. Okay. Now, okay. In terms of, you know, you, the, the, one of the qualifiers was, you know, why are you doing, only doing 20 or 30 deals or whatever? L- let's, let's get into systems. I know I'm bouncing around here a little bit, but let's, I want to talk, I don't want to waste too much of our time, um, focus on, on stuff that maybe, you know, people are not there yet, but I do know that everybody needs systems. And I do know that no matter what, Everybody has systems in place, whether they realize it or not, right? I mean, you, everybody has a, a typical morning routine. What, yeah. what are some of the systems uh, that, that, that uh, early, what, as you started to scale from 20, 30, 40, 50, um, uh, what are some of the systems you think that the two or three that everybody should have in place? But, you know, again, in your history, maybe you've seen more other people as they, as they get to that point, they, just, they, they either create a system that's inefficient or wrong. Um, let me clarify what I think systems are, Okay. you know, just so that we're, yep. we're clear on that, you know, systems are like what my assistants might do on a, on a daily basis. So they first would come into the office, they'd fire up the computer. They look through all of the different sites that we originate our real estate through. We look for any types of, uh, buyer or seller lead items. Uh, we hit that first. Uh, we also have someone that would open up all of our REO sites, uh, look at our foreclosure, uh, companies that we work with, and you know, if there's anything pending, we hit that right away. Uh, so and then we work from there. You know, we we may have two or three listings we did over the weekend. We're going to download and put all of that. Uh, we're going to work on the photos. We're going to make sure that all the information is correct. That, to me, is what our systems are. I mean, I obviously have have. Uh, you know, uh, data trackers in place that we can work with our buyers. We can send them information. Uh, we can send them mailers, emails, whatever we need to do with that. Um, we look at our existing listing inventory. Uh, we might say, you know what, we need two or three price reductions. We itemize those properties. We call those sellers. We have those conversations. That's every day. Every day what I just said happens uh, in my office. And it, And I think it you know, a lot of my staff can take care of a lot of those things. Um, my partner can, and if not, then I will. And those are the, the, the we prioritize things, and we work uh, we work uh, to the top of the pyramid from there. Do you have now? Now again, I know you have a small team. Um, with bigger teams, what I what I see, you know, how their structures are completely siloed, right? So, Sally, Sally meets Rick. Um, in her farm, right? So, and then Sally walks in, gives the new contact to Julie. Julie puts in the database, hands it over to Mike, the, the marketing guy. Mike then puts them on on a on a an appropriate drip, which would be you know buyer seller whatever. Um, yep. So so you know everything's very and and then and then um, you know Jimmy is the person who takes the photos. Uh, you know it, it, when you get a listing, right? Takes the photos. So. Do with a small team like you have, are you able to silo things off or or or, uh, or batch it like that, or is everybody kind of like a like a one man show a little bit? Well, no, we're, we don't we don't we don't really the drip we do. Um, I have, but I don't do it, you know, with an agent or with a you know you know with a with a prospect. What we try to do is meet with them, you know, get them in, get them involved right away in what they're looking for or, you know, what their listing's going to be. We try to keep that very personal. That's usually handled directly by uh, Bonnie, my partner, or myself. We try to make sure that that person isn't working with someone that, you know, really may not understand their marketplace, you know, some assistant. Uh, so we, we, we handle that right away. But, but a lot of that has to do with valuation. A lot of that has to do with, you know, when someone calls, they want to talk to 
the person in charge. We try to make that happen every time. And then from there, we may go where the property is managed a little bit more by one of our assistants or not managed in the sense that they're doing the showings. We still handle most of that ourselves. Um, and, it, and then I think it's one of the reasons, you know, I, t- turning 10 listings into 20 sales is important to us because we only need to do half of the work um, originating the listings. So we try to turn every buyer lead. We try to turn every contact into a listing, and I think we're very efficient at it. Now, we do have drip campaigns. We do automatic emails. Uh, we do automatic MLS searches. We do automatic. So we, we have a lot of great technology in place that we can manage our clients without having to make a phone call, without having to send a direct email ourselves. And I think those, for us, when we originate a prospect, is what makes us sell a lot more real estate in our area than, than, than an average team of our size. And so what, what are some of those things? So you're, you're leveraging technology, um, it sounds like. You're, you know, what are some of those things that you're, that you're using to, to get that extra leverage? Well, we have, we have some intercompany stuff. Uh, it's called the ProKit system. Uh, we have our local MLS has some great search options on it. Uh, we also have some automatic emails, that uh, auto systems that we put in place. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is, uh, like I said, direct email. You know, we're, we're going through on a, on a daily basis, weekly basis with our client base and letting them know what's going on in their marketplace. And some of it can be very vanilla. You know, we mm-hmm. may be, we may even be sending out just uh, very vanilla data that they could search for and find themselves, but we make it easy for them, I- including our large portfolio clients. Now, now um I'm a little just for for clarification. Um, you were just explaining what you do with your prospects, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. What What about when you get what, again? You, for you, you want to take ten listings and get twenty closed deals, right? So you want to double it. You, you want to double end it. Now, do you have any kind of technology that you utilize with with your you know actual uh, sellers? Um. To get leverage, to, to, to get something done without having to pick up the phone and make a, a call? No. Okay. Not specifically in that, in that, I mean, if you're talking about technology, like are we members of Realtor.com, yes. If we're members of Trulia, Zillow, yes. If, we're, if we share all of our data, yes. We do reciprocity with all of the other brokers in the state, yes. I mean, we do a lot of things that give us great exposure, Um and, you know, homes.com, XHome. I mean, we, we do a lot of that. I'm, I'm an NRBA member. I'm the master broker for Minnesota, um, National REO Brokers Association, um, default industry leaders. We're one of the members. So we, we branch out and do a lot of that other stuff that does help us within our portfolio sellers, our, our REO or our foreclosure sellers, but not as personal as, as we might with a normal uh, mom and pop seller or what we tell, what we would, we would detail as a retail seller. Okay. Yeah. And when I, when I, when I, when I, I got it. And for me, I was asking more about, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's Zapier, there's Trello, there's Skitch, there's Jing. There are all these little, little things yep. that, so, mm-hmm. okay. Um, yep. all right. So, so let me ask you this, Bruce, you know, you, what do you, what's working for you right now in your business? You know, I, Uniquely, I think one of the things that we've always been good at is forecasting. You know, and forecasting not zero to six months from now, but six to 18 months from now. Um, so we're always looking at what's going to happen, you know, 180 days from now. I'm not, I, you know, I, I thought we were, I kind of got an idea that we were going to see a little bit more con- new construction happen. And I, I don't think that that traction has really gravitated as well as, I thought it would, or even our market thought it would. Um, so what's working now is we're still working REO. We're still pushing towards short sales. We're still sending out to cancellations, expirations. We're still doing real estate 101. And um, I, I think that that is always going to keep you a productive real estate agent. Um, as far as what I think is really working, I you know, I, I don't think there's anything that's really grabbing a lot more attraction or traction than any of those few items that I described. I mean, foreclosure is still probably the best lead generator I have. Um, listings are still the best lead generations I generate. I mean, I carry between 40 and 80 listings. Um, and, and, you know, I hear how great our market is all the time. Well, if it was so great, I'd sell more than, you know, two to four houses a week. I, I still see 
a lot of uh, apprehensiveness in our in our market. Um, Interesting. And, and yeah, you know, and I, I always hear about how great everything is, but I, I'm not quite one of those agents that's, you know, saying we're at the top of the pyramid yet. I think we're somewhere in the middle. And then I think, you know, underpriced listings obviously sell in a timely manner, but when we're at market value, we're still seeing things struggle a little bit. Mm. So, you know, we're in a market that, you know, I, I wish I'd sell all of my listings today because, boy, that'd be a heck of a year. Well, certainly a good month. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yeah, well, I think, again, I, so you're, you are unique because that's not what's happening. In, in the rest of the, the nation, that's not what's happening, man. You know, it's, uh, that's, uh, you, you know, you're a little bit of an outlier in that regard. Um, okay, got and, and look, No, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, because I watch a lot of the media. I, I'm, I network with a ton of agents. And, you know, you, you know, most of these guys are carrying two, three, four listings. You know, they never had have or had the volume and, and a lot of them are selling multiple offers. Yeah. But you know, for some reason right now we we've, we've had, you know, a, a big influx in pricing. You know, I'm, I'm really at a term I use is called peak value. Peak value is the highest the house was ever worth at the time in the market at the, the highest part of our market, which is how I kind of look at stuff. What was the peak value of that house? Well, we're pretty close to that peak value mm-hmm. again. Yep. in our area. Yep. And a lot of the people that I network with, if I would give them that term and ask them the value, they're probably still 10 to 20% below. Now, I know that's not true in certain areas like California, New York. You know, It's not true here. It's not true maybe in Seattle. But if you go to Florida, if you go to the coast, um, east coast, um, you're probably still substantially below what might have been considered their peak value. Those areas are selling fairly quickly, but a lot of it is a value buy. You know, they've seen what's happened in, in this area or in the other areas, and, and we still have a big investor pool. We don't have a lot of cash transactions right now in my area. Golly, and man. because of And because of that, you know, we have a slowdown in our market. When we, had, when we had Blackstone buying in the Midwest here in the metro area, our market was hot. And they're really not buying properties because it doesn't fit their matrix anymore. Yeah, yeah, man. I, yeah, uh, you know, I told you before we, uh, before we started recording, we have a, a radio arm, and with you know when we get when we put an agent on radio, we, we, there always needs to be a hook. And I'll tell you that we six months ago, um, we were using we'll sell your house in in thirty days or you pay us nothing. That yeah. worked, and then that didn't work, and then we moved. And, and I, I'll, I'll speak directly to like Denver. Then we said we'll sell your house in ten days. Or you pay us nothing. That worked for a very small window, and now our, the, what we're doing, uh, uh, man, I don't want to tell everybody. What we, well, here's um, basically, basically, uh, and I just got myself into trouble here. I may delete this, but so here's what we're doing in most markets, and, and, and this is working. We're saying, hey, we're going to sell your house for full price, or we'll pay you three grand, five grand, whatever, depending on the average sale in the in the so. Um, very, very different in, in places like Denver and California than, than where you're at. Um, yeah. I had, I had a client just buy in Denver. I mean, they went out there and put, paid full price. Yeah. Um, they had to. Yeah, absolutely. The they could do. And really, if you, look at, if you look at past performance for the neighborhood they bought in, it was about 20% that they would have bought in um, 18 months ago. So that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good increase in value. Yep. Um, so, so. Look, what do you again? You're you're you know 50 years old. You've been at this for a long time. Um, what do what do you know now, Bruce? That you wish you would have known when you started, if anything. Well, I I I actually was one of those people a few years ago that wondered if our market would recover. I, I mean, I kept looking around at the number of default um, properties that I saw. And thought, wow, this is this is going to take us a while. And um, I, I should have I should have been that naive. I, I think that I, I'm impressed with the amount of value that we've gotten back over the last two years. Um, I'm actually amazed by the amount of value we've gotten back in the last two years, um, and I'm happy that we've gotten back that value because it certainly has been very good for our economy. Um, but I'm I'm a little I'm 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 a little uh, I see history repeating itself in a little bit with the yeah. fact that we've seen prices go up, yep. uh, down payment amount go down, uh, interest rates are starting to creep up. So we're, you know, we're kind of, you know, if, if I would look back on history, 
uh, you don't say, what would I, what, you know, what would I do differently? I probably would have told everyone, you know, and, and, you know, beat a horn, you know, beat a drum, blow a horn, you know, run down the street naked and tell them buy everything you can buy today. Cause in two years, prices are going to double. Yep. You know, I, uh, that would have been, <laughs> I'd have bought more land when it was so low. I mean, I, I bought some, I sold most of it in the last uh, few months. Um, I think that that would have been something, um, you know, as far as as far as real estate in general, as a as a real estate agent, yeah, I would have taken my contract with Blackstone more seriously. I think I sold you know two hundred fifty three hundred houses with them in two years, but I probably could have sold them six hundred if I wouldn't have not if I wouldn't have slept at night. So I mean, there's you know, or, or made my team bigger. I mean, there's a lot of things that you look back to. You know, um, I would have, I maybe would have done differently. You know, on our REO side, I. I I don't know if I could have done anything differently. I think we were very successful closing as much real estate as we did, and a lot of it was foreclosure. So, and and um, maybe short sales, maybe do more short sales because those, um, I think, were, you know, were a great part of our market and still are today. I'm still amazed that I'm running into so so many short sales. We've got the HELOC issue that's still coming. You know, um, a lot of those are personal notes and second mortgages and. You know, I think we're going to run into a lot of people that are going to look around and say, "I still can't sell my house." You know, not at not at a retail, not at a retail price, and 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 uh, and be able to move on. You know, hmm. we're going to be looking at short sales with people. Hmm. So, that's interesting. I, and again, I think that's that is. I think that's more. You're you're speaking specifically to your market, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I I would agree with you. I think you know when in '09. Um, you know, I did buy a bunch of stuff and I, I sold it. <laughs> and I wish I would have bought more and I wish I would have held it for longer. It was just, it was just, yeah. you know, I, I had some houses that literally were vacant for two years. I didn't try to rent them. I was scared about not being able to get people out. Cause again, in California, it's very hard to, to, to evict somebody. Um, so anyhow, okay. So, so here, let me ask you a crazy question. And I stole this from uh, my buddy, Tim Ferriss, but, but again, I think for you, it, it might make sense. And it's this. What what advice would you have given your thirty year old self? Again, and the stuff you just talked about right now was really more you know last five or six years. You know, what if you go back twenty years? What what advice would you have given your thirty year old self? Um, find a better mentor. Okay, no matter who you think you're working with, always look for a better mentor. Um, I think I, I had a very good one. I'm not even sure he knew was he was my mentor, but right. it was one of those people. I looked at the models that he put in place. I don't mean model homes. I mean models of success. And uh, I watched uh, him from afar, and I, I, I zeroed in on a lot of things that, that he did, uh, developing, building real estate, uh, mortgaging, uh, how he helped out people with uh, their entry uh, into a lot of the different positions that they became, like, you know, new builders, new realtors, you know, and I just, I, I really liked a lot of the things that he did. And when I developed land, I literally completely followed to the, to the T, you know, what he did and uh, was very successful. Every development I had sold out in less time than I, than I ever really uh, anticipated. They were more profitable than I ever anticipated. I, I was able to, um, you know, do all of that. A lot of it was, you know, knowledge that I got from either being in the military, college, past performance. But a big part of what I did was based on a model that I could follow, that I could decipher. And, you know, he set that up years before I would have ever thought about doing it. So find a great mentor. I mean, find a great coach. Uh, I've never had a real estate coach. Um, but, you know, I don't think that I'm, I'm probably too narcissistic to do that. So, <laughs> well, okay. So, so how does, um, and I'll, 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 well, you know, I'm coached by a very, very high level guy and I won't say his name cause some people know who he is and some people, uh, you know, everybody kind of knows this guy's name. And I find it amazing that, that what, what the advice that I get from him, um, he doesn't help me grow my business. That's not his bit. His bit is to make sure that I don't get out of control. And, you know, he, you know, his thing is like work life balance kind of a stuff. So, um, you know, he never, it's, it's amazing. He's a very, very, you know, five grand a month kind of a guy. Uh, and we have two calls, two 30 minute calls. So he basically pay I pay him $5,000 an hour. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, anyhow, I, I don't want to get off track there. So let me, so find a better mentor. Now, now, 
you said a couple of interesting things. You learned from this guy from afar. So he didn't know he was, you know, you, he was mentoring you. Um, how does somebody, and I don't know, I don't know how you really do that. If you were look, did it from afar, you know, how does, how did you figure out what a secret sauce was? Well, you know, I, when I, I was still a builder, when I kind of put two and two together and thought, boy, this doesn't look that hard, Yeah. but I know how hard it is. And, you know, I'd, went, I'd go into his office and I'd just question him. I'd ask him questions. I'd sit down with him. You know, and he was very open and he was very, um, I mean, he taught me how to structure land deals. You know, my biggest land deal, um, it was, you know, a hundred acre deal, you know, 17,000 an acre, 39,000 per site for land costs and, and, and uh, underground costs. My the biggest check that I wrote out of pocket to start and finish that was two thousand dollars. You know the profit on it was almost two million. That all came from someone like that. You know how to get how to get the land seller to participate in an equity stake. Right. You know how to get the bank to accept that as part of the contract. How to you know because if I'd have needed to write the check for it, you know you know I would have never been able to do it. But I saw how he did it. I saw how he invited his builders in, how he made them take lots down even before the streets were in, you know, how he did commitment levels and how he used other people's money as, you know, to leverage his profit. And I did the same thing. Wow. You know, but I was smart enough to realize what it is he was doing and how he was doing it. I mean, it's not like he spelled it out completely. I had to read between the lines on a lot of it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll, I'll briefly tell you about a deal that I did in, uh, in late 09, man. A, a Yuba City right out of Sacramento, um, a, a builder went belly up on a $73 million deal. 70, 7-3. Um, yeah. 525 fully developed lots, right? A curb and gutter in, undergrounds in, ready to go vertical, uh, 66 houses, and another 420 paper lots. Uh, me and three other people bought that for $3.2 million bucks. Right, and spent the next and spent the next four years getting rid of it, um, um, and that's one I wish I would have kept some of that, man. I didn't. I just said I said I'll just take my I'll just cash out and take my profits. So, so you were smart enough, Bruce. You were smart enough to read between the lines and figure out how to structure these things. Um, not everybody is like that, man. So, how does how does how, g- give the audience some advice on finding a mentor? And then convincing them to mentor them. And, I, and look, I get these calls all the time, right? I get emails all the time. Toby, listen, you know, I would love for you to mentor me. I can't do it. I have, I, I got too much stuff going on. Um, so for those people, you know, is there some kind of model that you've seen or that you can recommend for people to go out and find a mentor, right? Because people may go, well, I don't know what to look for. And then two, you know, convince these people to to spend ten minutes a week with them, or you know, or thirty minutes a month. I don't know. Well, the first thing is, if you're if you're looking for something like that, make sure that you're not making it work for the people that you're right that you're looking at, yeah. because then they won't appreciate it, and you'll never you'll never you'll never grow with it. Um, second thing is, you know, realize that it might be something that's ten minutes a week for you know ten weeks, and then you're moving on to someone else. Because we learn a little bit from each person that we work with or speak with, and if we're smart enough to learn a little bit, it 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 grows quickly. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, when I'm specifically talking about one person, but, you know, I've had a, I've probably had, you know, what I would consider 20 to 30 different mentors, people that I've looked at and, you know, spent time with because I understood they had something special and they had little things that I wanted to learn. And I think that's what I would look for. I would meet with people. If I, if I see their success, I would, you know, try to spend some time with them. I wanted to, I wanted to, you know, just get a better understanding of what they were doing. That was a little bit different. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about how they marketed. I'm not talking about those things, but people that are successful have something else. And, you know, everyone, it might be different for everyone, but, you know, I wanted to take a little bit of that home with me. And, you know, that's what I always tried to do. 
Okay. Yeah, and and look, I will I will agree with you, man. Don't make it work, you know. And for people, you know, people should have, you know, if, if they come to me or you and say, "Listen, I just need ten minutes of your time, fifteen minutes of your time," I'm happy to do that. But they need to ask me very specific questions that I can that I can give them and add value. And I think too many people want to ask me these really broad questions, and I, you know, and then it, you know, then yeah. I have to build backstory and go, "Look, I don't even know if you can get what I'm so." <clears throat> um. So, so when we talk about you structuring that deal, the biggest check you wrote was two grand, which is amazing for a two million dollar profit. Um, what what time period? How long did that take? Um, that was ninety eight through about two thousand and two, so right about four years. Okay, <clears throat> okay, yeah. But I mean, that was a side job. I mean, we we're still selling, you know, ten million a year in real estate. Still doing. I opened a mortgage wow, in '98. Wow. So I mean, it was you know that was that was a part time job for me. That's amazing. So so he, the reason why I, I set that up that way is I, I want to talk to you about risk. I think so many you know the, the the problem with people is you know they they don't necessarily have an abundance mindset. I have to believe that you did, Bruce. Um, but you know they they can't seem to stomach the risk of 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 either not having a steady paycheck. Uh, or or losing you know a, a, even a small number like two grand, what what uh, in terms of risk are, are you just innately risk oriented? Are you okay with risk? Or, or and if you're not, how 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 did you develop it? Well, in in two thousand and six, I had a number of different developments, all in some form of the planning phase, probably right around three million dollars out. I looked around and said. I don't want to do these. Shopped them, flipped them to another developer, of which he went bankrupt. He went into foreclosure. He lost everything. Be- wait, wait, because of those deals? Or because- no, yeah, because of those, well, that and what he was already working on. Interesting. And, and everyone said, why did you sell? I mean, even at the time, I, my banker's like, Bruce, we've done so well. Why are you selling? I'm like, I don't like the environment of our marketplace. And it's what I've said. I think what makes you successful isn't the things. I mean, you have to project. You know, what is it that I'm looking at six months to eighteen months from now? Yeah. And I, no one's coming to your model homes. We're not all of a sudden the only ones buying are foreign investors, and we're not even sure how legitimate they were back in oh six oh seven. And obviously, we've looked back on it now, and we can clearly say that they probably weren't that legitimate. You know, we had so many first time defaults, our first month defaults. So. Looking back at it, I, I think what I just said is, you know, how am I going to sell 300 lots per development in an environment where I'm not getting 300 people a year to look? So sometimes the best deals are the ones that you don't do, or sometimes the best deals are the ones that you get rid of. Um, I mean, I can't imagine what, what I would have done if I was still trying to make $25,000 a month payments. So getting out of those, you know, I, I didn't make any money on them. I lost the, everything on what we called carrybacks because we were carrying the mortgages on the, you know, positions on them at the time, and that, that ended up being something we never got paid on when they went into foreclosure and right. default. Wow. And thank God. I'm very happy that I didn't, uh, you know, if it would have been successful developments, I'd have made the money, and I'd have still been happy. But, you know, in the meantime, I didn't have to make those payments. So getting out of something, I think, is a great deal at times. But risk, risk adverse uh, people, I don't think you can fix them. Um, mm. You know, I think it's one of those things where, you know, there are so many people that pulled money out of the stock market when it went down to six thousand. We put all of ours in. You know, there's so many people that um, sold all of their land and never bought new land. I sold and then bought new. But I bought it when it went down, not when it went up. Um, and I sold it not when it went up. <laughs> so I, it's hard to categorize that. I mean, I wish I paid less in taxes. Yeah. But risk adverse people are always going to be risk adverse. You're not going to change that. Got it. Um, I think what you can do, um, you know, if you're risk adverse, is be a teacher, you know, go out and, and uh, get your nurse's license. I mean, there's a lot of jobs that you can do that are really, you know, probably meant for risk adverse people. Yeah, uh, well, it doesn't sound like you're risk adverse, and, and you know, no. you're not going to fix that person. They're they'll never be able to sleep at night. 
I've just had enough wins. I mean, I, you know, in college, I won't, I won't tell the story, but in college, I had this, this thing happen to me with, and, and I had a business. I put my, you know, I had a business during college. Um, and I had, I had two weeks. It was two weeks, man, where everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. And, uh, I didn't know how I was going to fix it. And literally over one weekend, I, 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 I completely rejiggered what I was doing and I, and went out, went out, hit the streets and got, uh, I, I painted houses in one week. And I went from negative to all of a sudden having uh, $20,000 worth of work, which, which uh, about 40% of that was profit. And again, I'm in, I mean, this is, I did it this in one weekend and I ended up the week before this, I had all of my, I had about 10 employees. They all quit due to me. Um, and again, over that, the next week I went out, rehired and retrained. And I realized then I was like, I'll never go hungry. And I can make anything work. So, so it's that it was that experience that has allowed me to be super risky, um, you know, in my later life. And look, I've lost millions of dollars, right? I've made millions of dollars, yeah. and I've lost millions of dollars, and I'm okay, I'm okay with that. Um, and I'm I, and again, I wish I knew some of the stuff that that I know now. Um, anyhow, so so um, I, I, this part what you said, Bruce. I want to start wrapping up here in a second. You know, you said you know getting out. Well, hold on. Let me ask you this. Specific. Let me look at the time. Okay. Um, when, I, when we talk about risk and risk averse, there's, there's lots of people who, and I get this email all the time. They're like, hey, you know, I'm doing X. I have some other kind of full-time job. I'm going to try to sell real estate part-time until I can get, you know, match my current income, and then I'm going to go full-time. What advice would you give to that person, right? Because they, they're, you know, they're, not super risk averse that they need to get a teacher's job, um, but they but they are they, again. This is a scarcity mindset rather than an abundance. And maybe they have a wife, maybe they have a couple of kids. What what yeah. would you say to that person? That your business model is already doomed to fail. Um, I, I you know one of the one of the mentors that I had. Um, he's still a re- real estate agent today. He had a great story. I won't say his name, but. He was a teacher, just despised being a teacher. And this was in the 80s. Couldn't give a house away. So he thought, how in the, you know, what am I going to do? So he, he went and talked to a broker, and, and this was, the broker was his mentor, and then uh, eventually. And then he said, his broker said to him this, Tom, what I want you to do is think about all the people you've met and know. Okay? He goes, now I, I want you to think about knowing 10, 20, 30 times the amount of other people. And Tom looked at him and said, how am I going to do that? And he got picked up the big phone book, threw it on his desk, and said, call 50 people a day. Mm. You'll be the most successful real estate agent in a year or two if you call 50 people a day. Now, you and I know we can't do that today, but there's other ways you can meet that. You can, you can meet that demand. And what Tom what was striking to, when I spoke to Tom about it, who is, by the way, a very successful real estate agent even in his twilight years now, he said this. He goes, I never got to 50. He goes, there were days I did 25 because the average was probably 15 to 20. He goes, you know, when you, when you call people, what they want to do, they want to talk to you. If you have something that you want to talk to them about, even today in that area, the same area he works, um, it's, in, it's a metro area, uh, a city, he's still one of the top real estate agents, year in, year out. He did all the simple things you do in real estate. He stayed in touch with his client base. He met new people all the time. He did a good job, and he has a, a solid farm, and he'll always be one of the top agents in his area because he did it. You can't do that in your example because the part-time real estate agent, once they get through the friends, once they get through the family, once they get through the people that trust them, your base isn't that solid. And until you decide, I'm going to go full-time, I'm going to open the doors, I'm going to go after a base, I'm going to set up a farm area, and I'm going to prove to everyone by knocking on their doors, yeah. you know, you're just not going to get the traction. Now, I see people that are successful that are part-time, but most of them work for a team, and they take buyers out nights and weekends. And success for them is probably labeled much different than for you or I. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um so, so let's say, let's say that person, I mean, and, and I, I coached a guy, 
uh, he, he was a, he was a top chef in this restaurant, but he's like, I have no life, right? Because I'm, I mean, literally, he was working like eighty hours a week. He, he and his him and his wife had different uh, schedules, so he never got to see her. And I and I, he's made like seventy five grand. I just said, quit, man. I said, quit. Just go. Just, exactly what you said. Go knock on doors, right? Go and just pick up the phone. Um, and he, I couldn't get him to do it. He, I just couldn't get him to do it. I stopped coaching him. I said, listen, I can't, I can't help you. I can't work with you. Um, if, if that person would have quit Bruce, um, and, and taken your advice to pick up the phone and, 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 and start knocking on doors, how long do you think, as long as they had reasonable sales skills or reasonable uh, interpersonal skills, how long do you think it would take them to, to get a listing? You know, it, it varies on your market, of course, because some markets you just don't have the, the listing volume, volume that we do or that you might. But um, it shouldn't take that long, especially if you haven't already burned through your friends and family. Uh, you're probably looking at you know, two to three weeks, maybe, maybe a month, if, if you're really not afraid to go out and market yourself. Um, and and, and there's, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to do that. You know, you obviously can't go out and market yourself as the expert, but you market yourself as the hardest working real estate agent in the business. Right. You know, because that's a, such a subjective term that, you know, you're honest about it because you might be for that day. So, you know, um, I, I think that if you push, if you, if you, if you are a salesperson, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm probably the worst real estate agent you'll ever meet, but I'm really good at sales. I'm really good at people. And what are you talking? Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? Explain that. Um, if you're good at sales, you can sell anything. Yeah. Okay. If you're good at real estate, all you are is limited to real estate. Now, a lot of what we do in real estate is, you know, we might focus too much on the foundation of the house, which is important. But if you're going to be good in sales, you have to you have to focus on the hundred percent. You have to focus from the roof to the foundation. And I think people that are really good at sales recognize that they recognize what it is that they need to do to make this transaction and the buyer and the seller successful versus just, you know, where do we, you know, what's in it for the deal. Yeah. And, and, and that's a fine line, but I think it's important to recognize Dang it! I wish I wish we'd have got to that earlier. I would have loved to, to talk about your your philosophy on sales, man. Um, but we just don't have enough time now. I always ask for a book recommendation, so hopefully you read. Um, here's the setup, Bruce. I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? Um, Out Swimming the Sharks, the Sharks by uh, Harvey McKay. Uh, probably not that well known. It's not really a per se real estate in the book but it's a sales book. It's about your network. It's about now he sold when he wrote it. He, he talked about business cards, portfolio cards, you know, how to keep, how to keep track of your client base. You know, everybody in our industry regrets at one point in time that they didn't keep track of their clients well enough. Yeah. His book talks about how you do that. What do you do in that book? He wrote two, Swimming with the Sharks and Not Swimming with the Sharks, both of them great. I mean, I, I also think, like, when you're talking about buy low, sell high, rich dad, poor dad, yeah. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of really, I, you know, actually in our office here, I started a book library because I read so many of these damn things that uh, I started a library where people come in and check them in, check them out. And they're welcome to add to the library. I don't think anyone ever has, but um, I see people taking them in and uh, and uh, you know reading them. And, and one of the books that I refer to a lot, but it, this is gonna you know, it's um, the Art of War. Um, it's it's a uh, Chinese yeah Sun Tzu book and it it's Sun Tzu yeah, and it's about you know. What, you know, how do you recognize what's in the heart of other people? I think that's a big part of that book. You know, you know, when you're trying to realize who your friends and enemies are, it's nice to have that perspective. Um, yeah. I, I, I've gone back to it many times. That's interesting. I have too. I don't, I think you probably get, you probably understand it a little bit more than me. I, I, it's, it's, uh, there's some stuff that, that, uh, some takeaways that I can digest, most of them I just don't get. But, um, uh, but yeah, there's, there's, and it's a quick read. I mean, everybody should read that. I mean, why not? It's, a, it's, a, it's, um, it's one of those classic ones. And look, I'm going to talk to the audience really quickly. So guys, 
if you want to, if you want to, number one, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad that uh, one of the things I'm back to you now, Bruce, you know, so you're illustrating even at with your success, even at your age, you're constantly learning and you, and you find value in that. And, and I, I think too many people go, yeah, yeah, I know how to sell. I'm moving on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know how to do social media. I'm moving on. And you, you, there's always something, even if it's one nugget you can get out of reading, you know, a 300 page book, um, you should do it. So. Everybody, if you want to read Harvey McKay's Swim with the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive, outsell, outmanage, outmotivate, and outnegotiate your competition, uh, get a free copy on us. Just use our link. Just go to audibletrial.com slash superagentslive and get a free Audible copy. Um, hey, Bruce, look, man, it's been great spending time with you. I always encourage my audience, if they've gotten anything out of this, this episode with you, to reach out and say thank you to you. And I'm sure... I, so, and don't, I don't want you to give your phone number um, because I, we've talked about mentoring and blah, blah, blah. I, I have my senses you're going to get a lot of emails going, geez, hey, Bruce, can you mentor me? Um, but look, where can people find you? Um, just email me at Bruce McAlpin, B-R-U-C-E-M-C-A-L-P-I-N, at edina, realty.com. That's E-D-I-N-A-R-E-A-L-T-Y.com. Perfect. And guys, if you're... Walking the dog, riding your bike, or, or driving to work. All this stuff will be on the show notes. Just go to superagentslive.com and, and look for Bruce McAlpin. Hey, Bruce, I'll be the first to kick off the thank you train. Thanks, man. I know you got a lot of stuff going on, uh, so I appreciate you taking an hour out of your day to share with me and my audience. No problem. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Let's keep in touch. Bye. Yeah. Let's go.